Okay, so um, Peter Russ and I are going to talk about the uh, Transmark COVID uh, project. Um, and uh, again, thank you to, to Dell for the support uh, of the project. Um, as uh, the COVID um, was, uh, was becoming clearly a, a huge issue, um, we started thinking about, so from the Transmark perspective, what, um, you know, what, what could we do really to, to get, um, you know, Transmark ready and, and, and uh, use, useful uh, for the community. And actually Keith Elliston uh, came up with the idea to, you know, uh, along the lines uh, of our interest in open data uh, to start to look at, are there data sets available that would be of interest to, to um, researchers uh, that we could preload into Transmart uh, and make these available. And so uh, in, in doing some quick scans, we, we noticed that there were um, uh, geo data sets starting to come online uh, and that it could actually be useful. And as we looked closer at them, it was pretty clear that these, these could be uh, interesting for groups starting up, uh, looking to you know, get their, their hands on some, some initial data it's always so hard when you start a new project to, to just get, you know, get a kind of a lay of the land and what, what types of data, what types of information is out there. Uh, and so in, in looking at the things that were, were coming, it became clear that this was uh, you know, something that we could actually do. Uh, and so uh, we, we initiated this project, uh, thanks to Blending to Dell, uh, to actually find the, the, the various data sets that uh, would be amenable to Transmart that we could do some, some uh, cleanup work, some, some curation uh, and bring them in and make them uh, basically Transmart ready, uh, load, load the data sets into Transmart uh, studies. And then um, since these were all open, uh, freely available information um, that we could make these then available uh, in a library. And then that's, that's uh, what we did. And uh, that's what we'd like to, to describe now. Um, we've found that, um, uh, last year, we started this project, uh, and throughout the project, it's it's been pretty clear that there, you know, something like five new studies per week have been getting uh, published and made available, uh, and so we've been working on gathering these and, and collecting them um, again, as I said, in, in transmart format. Um, this has a, been a, a cooperative project uh, with Axiomedics uh, and, and Keith Elliston, its company, uh, to uh, to really get this work. You know, done and get the, the data sets <clears throat> pulled together. So I'm going to turn it over to Peter Rice, who's actually done the, all, all of this work to get these data sets um, loaded and cleaned up, and um, let let Peter describe it for us what uh, what actually he's done and what's there today. Uh, Peter, are you available? Yeah, thanks very much, Rudy. Can you hear me? Yes, sounds yep. Lovely. Perfect. So, so as you can see, we we started off. Um, by the time we had our, our first virtual datathon, which was in November last year, we had some 90 um, SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19 studies to curate, and we had about the same number of other studies that were related. So the, the previous coronavirus outbreaks, SARS and MERS, which is still ongoing, plus uh, a number of studies on other coronaviruses, uh, human and animal. And 10 related studies, these are things like um, gene expression in healthy lungs and healthy model organisms for comparison. So we worked our way through curating those. The, uh, the old SARS ones were pretty easy because they were gene expression and Transmark can handle that fairly automatically and GEO has a standard way of doing it. It's what GEO is there for. Um, the COVID ones were somewhat more problematic because they entirely RNA-seq data and RNA-seq data is a make it up as you go along data type. So when you get the information from GEO, you get some clinical data and you get a bunch of files. <laughs> they are not in any necessarily standard format. So we're working our way through the, trying to automate the curation of that. So first time round, we did them all by hand. This time round, we think we can automate most of them and uh, make that easier. We've had a, a set of servers that I'll, I'll go through, the staging server for looking at the initial curation of the studies and checking whether um, the way it's curated makes sense. And then we, we had a public server set up for the datathon to look at the completed studies and do the analysis and a library server so that it's possible to download these studies and load them into your own systems or you can yeah, use the public servers. Okay, next slide please, Rudy. 
so we thought we were going to have five new studies per week uh, when we started the second round. It's running rather higher than that. So five studies a week is, is kind of 20, 22 per month. Um, it was pushing 30 most months. Uh, this month's been quiet. I'm not sure why. I'm expecting there'll be a rush at the end. There'll be a catch up. I thought August might be quiet, but, but June has so far been a quiet month, but you can see April more than makes up for it. Um, and so we're work <coughs> sorry, working on automating the data curation so that we can uh, get things not only loaded relatively quickly into the servers, but also in a consistent manner. Can I have the uh, next slide, Rudy? So we also found in the datathon that we needed to go through and recurate some of the studies. When we went back to GEO, we found that there have been various changes to the studies since we'd originally downloaded them. Some of those are um, adding citations, as you'd expect, COVID studies have been made publicly available before the citation has come out. And so we can put those into the, um, into the database so you can then link to the papers. We've also found updates to the data. Sometimes that's a significant update. Sometimes it's just renaming some files, but we need to go through and compare all of those and work out what has changed. So we're currently going through all of the updates and trying to figure out what's different for the studies we've had before and draw some lessons for how often to update the, uh, the current studies that we're loading, the new ones. We have found uh, some issues with the clinical data. So you get some non-numeric values like the age column might say unknown, not available, or actually various other things. There's not much curation of how that's handled in GEO. So we'll put some extra checks for any column that looks like numeric data and sometimes isn't. There are other cases where one, two, and three have specific meanings and they should be translated into some text. So we'll try to catch those. Uh, one of the things we did was we automated loading the uh, browse tab metadata, so information about the study, a description of the study, information about the number of subjects, the number of samples, uh, the date that the study was done, and that kind of information from GEO, which you could always load into Transmart, but you had to load it in by hand as an administrator. And so we now have an automated load, so there will be a, a make target in Transmart 19.1. You can load data for the browse tab along with the study. And that will make it much easier then to search for studies and find out information about what the study actually um, does for you. Otherwise, in Transmark, you just see a name and you see some metadata, you see some study data, but it doesn't give you the background of what the study was for with the links to the publication. And as I say, we're hoping to automate the RNA seq data curation. Um, can I have next slide, please? So the RNA-seq data comes as a bunch of files. Sometimes you get a tar file that turns into lots of other files. Sometimes you get a bunch of other files and sometimes you get both. And they change. You get data, um, supplementary data reissued for studies a week or two after the study's first been released. So you have to keep going back to check what's new. Uh, we're trying to work on ways to classify, for example, is this just an RNA-seq study or is this a single cell study? And if it's a single cell study, What's the basis of it? There are spatial studies and various others out there using single cell technology. Uh, try to figure out if we're going to load this um, if it's single cell um, accumulating data over cell types, for example, is often the way that it looks best to load it into Transmart. And in some cases, we may decide we want to load them in several ways. So we'll set up multiple subject, multiple study IDs and load the data in several ways and then ask anyone can have a look at our staging server and see which one works best for them. Some might be better for analysis, some might be too many samples for Transmart to cope with. We'll try to check the scalability there as well. Uh, a lot of the data is in various R um, formats, so we need to export the data from these various R files and uh, convert it into data that we can then manipulate, simple tables we can load into uh, Transmart. You also get tables of data, and if you're really lucky, they have um, column one is the gene name, and each of the other columns is the data for each sample. And if you're really lucky, the sample ID is GSM, something that matches what GEO has. Often you find the sample ID is actually some text string that may match something else in the sample data, or it may be the, something they've made up as a short name for the data. And sometimes, yeah, you actually get 
one data file for each um, sample. And you have to find where the counts actually are in there. And there's some other data associated with them. You can have gene name and gene ID and a bunch of other things in the other columns. So basically trying to find the gene names, trying to find the sample IDs and trying to find where the counts are. And then we can automate loading from there. And it shouldn't be too difficult in most cases. So we can take the previous studies and check that we get basically the same answer when we do this. And then we can apply those to the 150 or so new data sets that we have and work our way through those. What we're trying to do with RNA-seq data is load things as TPN. So you've normalized for the length of the gene. And so that means we have to find out the gene lengths in various monkey species and other model organisms and then normalize for a million reads as well. So then you have data that you can compare from sample to sample and get reasonably good um, comparisons. OK, next slide, Rudy. So we had a staging server set up where we were loading data. And uh, that has all the, the studies that we had in the first phase. And we're working our way through recurating those studies so we can uh, compare whether we get basically the same answer with the automatic curation. Uh, you can log on to that just as a guest and uh, explore the data. Um, we also want to uh, check through some of the, the basics on there, and see where we can find um, so, yeah, alphabetic characters in amongst the age data and so on. But hopefully we can automate most of that with scripts. And it has uh, metadata loaded for the studies as well. We want to um, review that because GEO is actually full of typos. If you want to search for data in the, the GEO metadata, sometimes things are, are misspelled. We had a public server set up for the Datathon um, that was running as a temporary instance on AWS. We're going to set up a, an Axiomedic server instance and update that as we recreate the studies, we will load them onto there. Um, and we're planning to use uh, Transmart 19.1, more of that later, but basically the current state of the development code can automatically load the Browse tab data and has a, um, some speed ups for RNA-seq data. But, um, and we also need a good test bed for it. So this would be a good place to, to test. We'll run the staging server and the public server on that if we can. If we have any issues, we go back to Transmart 19 and we'll have to load some of the Browse data uh, by hand. But that won't be too difficult. Okay, next. And the other server is the library server. This is where we make all of the data sets available in uh, Transmart ready form. So there's clinical data, there are platforms of gene names or gene IDs, and there are um, the RNA seq data that we've curated. So that will automatically load up all of the samples and all the, the clinical or the sample data into Transmart. In many cases, we've actually loaded one sample as a subject. Uh, it gives us much richer data about the samples for analysis and where the subject is a cell line that was infected with COVID or has been given some treatment. Um, it's not so particular about having any other clinical data about it. There's not very much to say apart from the organism. So we're using it to, to put the sample data in as clinical data, sample metadata. And we're hoping to use that to drive whether we can expand the way sample data is handled in Transmart, seeing what would be useful data for doing comparisons and queries. Uh, also on the library server, we're going to um, look at recurating the existing data that we have, standardizing the node names so that they all look consistent, adding that browse tab metadata so we'll download it from GEO and give the metadata for each of the studies. It can be loaded automatically. And also as part of Transmart 19.1, we want to have some test data sets, partly to, to test Transmart. So you load up these standard um, data sets and you can then test Transmart works um, with a standard data set for each data type. Also the data types that are used for examples of the documentation. So you can repeat the example in the manual and then understand how it works. And thirdly, for testing Transmart, it would be really nice to have some examples of bad data so you can test the error messages in ETLs and make sure they fail the right way consistently each time. So we'll, we'll flag them as bad data so you won't pick them up by accident. But they could be very useful for, for testing other ETL processes, anyone who's looking after other systems and checking whether the, the data still loads for them or if it fails in the appropriate way. 
think that was the last slide for this section, Rudy. Yeah. So any questions or Rudy, do you have anything that I've missed? Trying to find uh, the unmute button. <laughs> I was talking. Yeah, no, just that, that the this data is now available. It's it's there. Uh, up, you know, uh, and you know, you're welcome to to use it. And um, if you have any questions, please let us know. I'm happy to answer any questions now. One thing I could add is when we have all the studies on the library server, there will be more COVID studies than there are the, the previously curated studies. I think. There's there was a question some from the Etrix project and about 50 to 100 others. There is a hand raised from Ulrich Sachs. I'm going to unmute you. Go ahead, Ulrich. He got muted again. I think he, he unmuted at the same time. <laughs> no, no, I think not got to work yet. You got no, it. Thank, Thank you for, for your talk. It's um, and I like the data set a lot. So um, we use it um, as well for um, for our national research data infrastructure project. Uh, you know, just as a, a benchmark which studies are in, and for teaching a lot. So because those are real world data sets, they're right. really valuable for uh, you know search patterns, etc. The question would be as it's based on Transplant 19, and we would like to have some you know more, more samples. So if you got a, a model of one patient and one sample, it's easy. But usually you got one patient, maybe several samples. Are you planning on updating uh, or just testing the uh, I2B2 data model in this setting as well? I, in my opinion, it would be very nice and very, uh, <laughs> very much needed actually for other projects. And I think this would be a wonderful test, but because it's you know it's real data and people are looking at it. You, you want to test the data in I2B2 as well, or you wanted to just no in the uh, you know our old question uh, the uh, you now the transma data model has difficulties with several samples uh, per patient, and yes, with the uh, you know with the data model combined I2B2 and transma it would be much easier as well for temporal queries as well as for um, the, the the model allowing the several samples per patient. Yes, so yes. maybe a bit more of this in the in the roadmap session later but yes we're looking at how we could handle temporal queries yeah. there are some oddities in transmart studies compared to itb2 so the covid studies are typically something happens after six hours 12 hours 24 hours 48 hours and there is no date in the study okay so <laughs> it's just, it's a, just a testimonial point. that it's that it's awesome to have this data set it's really great yeah. so we, we, we need to look at ways in transmart to query time intervals as well as ways to query by date Obviously, if you're in a pharma company with your own studies, you might well have dates attached to your, your data. But for stuff from Geo, it's, it's just the time interval. We need to be able to query those as well. Uh, so what we're doing at the moment is loading up the intervals as part of the sample data so we can explore the queries and see what would be useful in the interface. And I'd also actually be interested in some of your teaching examples and whether we can uh, no. look at loading those up. I was thinking that too, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just a uh, you know practical part on people learning how to select, how to filter, yeah. and I think Transmart is great for data reviews. So yeah. we're using Transmart as, as well with uh, the dirty data. So we got one with the American Gut Project, which is yeah, there's a not cleaned up version, which is really good. Yeah, I'd say yes, dirty data is very useful for teaching. Can you spot what's wrong? 